everybody. I want to remind you of the different ways that you could send your tithes and your offering. You could do it through texting. If you don't have access to Google Play or the App Store, just send a text to 601-273-4609 and send it to the word GIVE. After that, you'll receive a text message back and then just follow the simple instructions, the simple steps, and you're all set up. Also, you can use the Tidely app. Just download the app from the Google Play or the App Store, and you can set up the amount that you want to give, and you can send it to Springs of Praise World Outreach Center, or you can mail it to Post Office Box 549, Crystal Springs, Mississippi, 39059. If you want to drop it off at the uh, church office, the office is open Tuesdays through Thursdays from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. And as always, I want to thank you for watching this program. Well, let's stand together. I want to read some scriptures to you uh, that I believe that the Lord has given me for this morning to finish up this year by last message of the year and it's Acts chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 thank you Chris for helping me and he shall send Jesus Christ which is talking about our Father God he will send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times everyone say the times that's a particular, we didn't highlight that word, but times, but I want you to hold on to that. It's the times of the restitution of all things. Let's read that yellow line. Restitution of all things. Not some things. Restitution of all things. Which God had spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. That's what we're preaching on, the times of the restitution. Okay? And the next verse is Romans 9.28. For he, God, will finish the work, and he will do what to it? Cut it short. Cut it short in righteousness, because it's the right thing to do. That's what it's saying. The right thing is he's going to have to cut it short, because a short work, he repeats that word short twice, will the Lord make upon the earth. I want to speak for a few minutes on the question. Do you know what time it is. Father, help us to be a better discerning group than the Pharisees when Jesus, you said, you know how to discern the sky. You know how to tell when a storm's coming, but you don't know how to discern the times. Help us to realize that we are in a time as, as Americans <coughs> we've never been in before. As Christians, we've never faced anything like this. Something's happening minute by minute. Darkness is getting darker week by week. Washington comes up with more goofy stuff week after week that seems to cast a darkness over our land. Lord, help us to realize that it doesn't matter what comes out of Washington. It's what comes out of heaven that's going to really make the difference on planet Earth. So, Lord, you're going to do what we sang last week and what we were singing about a while ago. The light still shines. <laughs> amen. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I really believe with all my heart that we, right now, which is... Be, I pinch myself to say I'm a part of this. We are in a time of acceleration. Like the pedal has been put to the metal and this thing, things are moving quicker and faster. Almost daily hearing things coming out of the news that we see is changing the America that we grew up with. Things are changing. So the restitution of all things is going to happen at a certain time. December 14th, 2012, nine years ago, this week, this past week, 
seven-year-old Daniel Barden from his new town Connecticut house opens the window and looks out. The little seven-year-old boy is looking at the sun beginning to peak over that area. He looks out and sees the orangish, reddish sky, beautiful, silhouetted by homes that have Christmas lights all down through the neighborhood. And it was so pretty, he turned to his dad as they're both looking at it. And Daniel says to dad, dad, isn't that beautiful? Well, Dad thought it was beautiful. He got the camera and took a picture of it. And there were special moments that morning with little Daniel, just like that. At one point, he ran out in his PJs and his flip-flops and grabbed a hold of his sister's neck, Natalie, and hugged her and wished her a good day at the school. He's just so joyous. Went back inside and asked Dad, and they sat at the piano and played jingle bells together. And he was upstairs brushing his teeth when he heard Mom getting ready to go to work. And he runs downstairs with a toothbrush in his mouth and hugs Mama goodbye. And it's a Merry Christmas. The whole atmosphere is a fun-filled, carefree Christmas season morning for seven-year-old Daniel. Of course, the family did not know that that's the last time they would see Daniel alive again. Because Daniel was a part of 20 kids that were murdered in the Sandy Hook Elementary Massacre. And we've had massacres before, but we didn't have anything like this. These were not adults, not even teenagers. These were little bit of kids, elementary kids. Uh, they weren't a gang of people. They were backpacking, Christmas-loving kiddos, and for heaven's sake, it was the Christmas season. And when we watched this, I watched it on TV, and many of you did, uh, I thought to myself, this is a quiet neighborhood, this is just kids. I thought, my goodness, life sometimes sure isn't fair. That's right. Nothing good about that seemed to be at all. And I wondered in my mind when I saw the pictures and the, the grieving, these kids did not deserve to die. The parents did not deserve to go through that Christmas with the loss of their child. They didn't deserve that. Amen. But I wondered, in that imbalance, there was an imbalance there. It's like there was a shift in, in, in the very atmosphere around that town, that something went completely haywire and wrong, and you wonder, is it ever going to get straightened out? Now, I don't know about you. But if I'm watching a movie and the bad guys are getting in a lot of extra licks and they're shooting all the good guys, and it look, I mean, injustices are taking place where people are getting beat up and all kinds of uh, you know, attitudes and things are wrong, and I'm sitting there saying, when is John Wayne going to get here? <laughs> when, when does lo the, the, the Lone Ranger arrive? Uh, When's this going to get straightened out? Because I don't want, don't want to watch a movie that it keeps staying bad. I want something to change for justice. That person gets it. Uh, we watched something last night. Uh, uh, it's FBI. It's a, a, a true stories about the woman that could read lips. And it's a Christian program. Uh, very clean. But uh, there was a guy out there that had a horrible attitude and really... Uh, his actions have cost a life. And, and the whole time I'm waiting till the end of the show, when's he going to get it? And he never gets it. Am I telling you right? He never gets it. And I'm thinking, how disappointing. I want him to get it. <laughs> I want the guy that did our graffiti that I wanted him to get caught. Are, are y'all with me? Yeah. Injustices bother me. Yeah. Amen. Don't. Don't let me stand in line at Walmart for 30 minutes and you stick your nose in between us. Because the spirit of anointing comes on preachers. Yeah. Is there a time when this all is going to get straightened out? Where things, where you've had injustices, finally the person that's been doing it or the things that have been happening to you gets rectified and changed. It is. We read it just a moment ago. It says there's going to come a time in the times there's going to be, in God's timing, a restoring, a restitution of how many things? Oh. Don't that make you want to shout? Yeah. 
The Lone Ranger's coming. It's, it, 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 he's, this one's riding on a white horse. He's the good guy. And we remedy this thing one day. Amen. I like that. Now, Abram has been given a vision by God. Your family is going to spend a lot of years in captivity. But I'm going to pull them out. But it's going to be when the cup of the Amorites is full. When their iniquity is full. Then, I, In other words, there's a timing to this. When, when God, listen to me, this is very important this morning. When God begins to do certain things, it looks like it takes forever for him to ever get there. But when God begins to move, you watch out the acceleration of times that takes place. The first place in the Bible that it mentions the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 23. And it says, if you'll hearken unto me, I will pour out my spirit upon you, he says in Proverbs. Well, you go 200 years later, nothing said for 200 years, to Isaiah and his contemporary, which is Joel, they both said God is going to pour out his spirit on a thirsty land. And then Joel says, in the last days I'll pour my spirit on, on all flesh. So both of them talk about it. And you're getting ready for this outpouring. 700 years later. That's a long time. John the Baptist comes on the scene. And all of a sudden, the fullness of time is coming. Yes. Yeah. Things are going to get speeded up. Because he says, there's one coming after me. I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And it don't take 200 years. It don't take 700 years. Three and a half years later, Jesus stands up and says, go into Jerusalem and tarry until I pour down this spirit upon you from up on high. And it didn't take three and a half years for it to happen. It took ten days. For when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place in one accord. And there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It came on a certain day, but it came quick. Once Jesus said, it's coming, it was ten days later and the outpouring came. God is an on-time God. He's an on-time God. We can say that guy. Yes, he is. He says in Ecclesiastes, there's a time for every purpose under heaven. In other words, God has got a watch. And can I tell you, his watch is perfect. I know what you say. Well, I've been waiting on God a lot of times, and he was late. No, you were early. <laughs> no, he was slow. No, you were too fast. The first words out of Jesus' mouth in Mark's gospel is this. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. When he said that, watch out. For three years after he made that statement, there were so many miracles done by Jesus. The Bible says there's not enough books in the world to contain the things he did. We only have a few of his miracles. Because all of a sudden, accelerated time was miracle after miracle, miracle constantly. Hundreds and thousands and thousands of them taking place because of accelerated time. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever questioned God's timing? Have you ever questioned God's timing? Come on, be honest. I have. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha did. You remember in Mark, John 11, they sent a message to Jesus saying, the man that you love is sick. Lazarus, whom you love is sick. And Jesus makes a statement. Now, please get this. Stay with me a few minutes and I'll let you go home. No amens. We're staying two hours. And they locked the doors. No, uh, the messenger came and said to Jesus, the one you love, Lazarus, is sick. And Jesus makes a statement. This sickness is not unto death. And the messenger hightails it back, the 17 miles, back to Bethany, and tells the family, don't have to worry about a thing. Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death. He misinterpreted it. The wording is simply this, this sickness will not end in death. The end will not be a death. In other words, there was a resurrection in there, but that wasn't part of what he said, so therefore it got misinterpreted. And can you imagine? I believe this is what happened right here. No, I don't see him yet. No, I, I'm looking. Can you imagine Lazarus laying there, getting close to death? <gasps> is 
Jesus, is he coming? Did you hear it? Any little bump, knock, any little bit of hope? It's Jesus, and he'll save the day. Well, he didn't ride in on the white horse, and nobody gets saved. And that's why Mary wouldn't even go out to see him, the one that loved him and would sit at his feet and didn't even go out to see him. Martha went out to see him. Lord, if you'd have been here, those were words that had a lot of heart in it. Our brother would not have died. In other words, you did not show up on time. Have you ever asked, why didn't you show up when I wanted you to show up? Come on. Why didn't, why didn't the Lord send his son when Adam and Eve sinned? That's when the problem began. Why not? Instead of letting all of us be a part of the problem, just nip it in, that's Barney Fife, you know, nip it in the bud. I mean, get this thing handled right off the bat. And then another question is, why didn't God wait until now to send Jesus? I mean, seven billion people, satellites everywhere, the birth of Jesus, the resurrection, the death, all that on satellite? How many millions of people could be saved through that? Why didn't God wait till now? And then I have a, another question. Why did God wait for certain things to happen in my life? Why didn't he save me earlier? Why did I have to go through the mistakes and the problems and the, the things that I wished I hadn't have done? Uh, why, did, why did I have to go through that? I, I don't have any answers, but I'll tell you this. Whatever the reason that God saved me when he did or saved you, it was in God's perfect timing. He doesn't make any mistakes. And he knew when this world would be right for Jesus to come in the fullness of time. God made a, of a woman, Jesus, in Mary's body. God had the perfect timing. He knew what he was doing. And sometimes it looks like he doesn't know what he's doing. You women know this. When you have a baby inside of you, nine months is a long time. Amen? I mean, by the ninth month, my daughter-in-law just had our grandson this past week, and I tell you what, she was miserable. <laughs> I tell you what, it's a and you know what? You wait and you wait and you wait, but when the moment arrives, no longer is it months. It may not even be days. It could be minutes. Hours and when there's an acceleration when birth is about to take place things happen Jesus said when I come back Paul the Apostle Paul said this when he comes back It'll be like a woman that's having a baby the accelerated time things will begin to happen rapidly Who thought America could go down so quickly as we have in one year's time? I tell you what Run, the, the, the Soviet Union had no idea in 1989 that that vast empire, at one time bigger than us and greater in their military might than us, in one day's time became no more. God can accelerate where he conquers the enemy of your life quickly, fast. Can I have an amen? amen. What's he going to do? The restitution of all things. What does that mean? Joel said, I will restore the years that the canker worm, the locust, the canker worm, the palm worm, and the caterpillar, four creatures, have destroyed. I'll, I will restore, say it with me, years. Years. Listen, when those four creatures hit a crop, one got the leaf, one got the bark, the other's got the roots. There wasn't anything left on the ground. They ate the whole thing. In other words, the, listen to me. The prophet was saying something that is so utterly destroyed, there's not anything to see. It's gone. It's empty. It looks like a wasted barren land. I remember walking out on my grandpa's farm during the wintertime in Oklahoma and looking at that hard, crusted ground that was frozen over thinking to myself, boy, this this will never grow anything again. But my grandpa was a farmer. Richard's almanac, he religiously looked at it. He knew that he had planted seed, he had put it in the ground, and there'd come a time, an acceleration of growth, and all of a sudden, grandpa would be out there saying, I know it's down there, it's going to come up. And when it starts coming up, look out, boy, we're going to have a harvest. I'm telling you, it may look like nothing is happening, but in the acceleration of time, God 
is going to restore all things. Yes. Quickly. You understand? Quickly. In Mark chapter 5, that demoniac had lived for years in the tombs. Nobody went around him. Cut himself. They tried to bind him in chains. And listen to what Jesus said. He cast it out of him. Restores his mind. Puts clothes back on him. And makes the most profound statement. Go home and tell your friends. He didn't have no friends. But in one breath, Jesus restored every friend he had ever had. And says, I'm giving you your friends back. Wow. And you, you know what? He went and he told them, his friends... And the Bible says the next time Jesus came to that shore, that was the miracle of the 4,000 feeding. Where in the world did 4,000 people come from to be fed, plus women and children? It's because one man went back and made some new friends that God had restored. I tell you, I just thought of that. I'm glory to God. God's able to restore families, your friends, everything. The woman with 12 years of issues in her body instantly healed. By the power of Jesus. She went to touch H-E-E-M and she got a hold of H-I-M and she was totally healed. The woman with 18 years bent over, healed instantly. The man with 38 years beside the pool, healed and restored instantly. Turn to somebody and say, he's about to do a quick work in you. Would you do that? He's about to do a quick work in you. I showed a picture of this one time, and you'll remember it. It's called the Chinese bamboo plant. And we know that in, I've been to China many times and seen them, and they're massive. I'm telling you, you plant them, four years, there's nothing. You see nothing. Water it, fertilize it, wait on it, make sure that the sun hits it just right, everything's atmospherically correct for it to grow, you'll see absolutely nothing. And then in the fifth year, look out. In the fifth year, it'll go from zero to 80 feet in one year. You can just sit there almost and watch it grow. Zero to 80 feet in one year. And I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart this morning to come and tell you that some of you have been planting seeds, praying for loved ones. You've been doing everything you can to live a life that's pleasing to God, and you haven't seen squat. And yet your life looks like it, areas of fruitfulness should be there, but it's not. It's barren land, and you're wondering, Lord, are you ever going to hear my prayer? And I believe the Lord spoke to my heart and said, you tell some folks there that this is their fifth year that's about to come. They haven't seen anything, but there's been a massive structure going on underneath the soil. There's been roots that I've been planting. And all of a sudden, in the fifth year, you're going to receive what you've been planning for, wanting to happen. Seeds are going to come out of the ground because this is your future. If you believe that's my fifth year, stand to your feet. Somebody say, this is my year. This is my year. 2022. Paul said it's the year of hope, that the words mean the year of hope. You may be seated. I believe that David... After Samuel came and poured that oil on his head, told him he's going to be king. They did it privately. But in his heart, David said, Samuel, not one word of his falls to the ground. That's what the Bible said. I'm going to be king. But what happened was stinking, smelling sheep. Not a day or two. Not weeks, not months, years, years of a promise. Years. You're not going to just be some, you're going to be a king over Israel. Yes. But nothing. And the day the dad says, you're not even fit to be called up for the anointing prayer. And then he sends him on an errand. Your brothers are fighting, but you're the errand boy. Cheese and crackers, take them. Talk about a nothing special day. Running an errand. I feel like when I run an errand to the grocery store for my wife, it's a curse day. <laughs> I just had to do that the last couple of days or whatever. I, I went up and down every aisle. I didn't have to walk my two miles that morning. I got them in the grocery store. 
I said, and I told the lady, the lady was standing there. I said, well, you know where this is at. When you, when, when. I said, I'm a man. I don't know where anything's in here. I'm, a, I'm going everywhere looking for nothing. I don't know what it is. You know, and, and that's a nothing day. You know, that was a nothing day for David. Crackers and cheese to the brothers who are getting in the battle, wanting to fight. And before that day was out, David's name was known from Dan to Beersheba one day. Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. In one day's time, little nobody, no nothing, no, no notoriety, nobody even looks to him for anything, is known as the champion of Israel. In one day's time, what make the difference? One touch of the favor of God. One touch of the timing of God changes everything in your life. You hear me? 2022 is going to be a life-changing year, I believe, for people. I don't feel like I'm giving this out of my flesh. I believe I'm telling you folks, 2022 is going to be a year you mark it down. You mark it down. God is going to do accelerated time in your life. Billy Graham, 1949, preaching Poda collars, open doors, classrooms, wherever he could preach. But he preached a little tent meeting over in Los Angeles, and William Randolph Hearst, the newspaper tycoon, comes and God touches his heart. The next day, William Randolph Hearst contacts his, new, contacts his newspapers across America and says, I want you to run Billy Graham on every issue. I want you to tell what God is doing here in Los Angeles, and let's tell about Billy Graham. In one day's time, Billy Graham became a nationwide success. He had taken him all his life to have got to that realm, to that area of success. But one man, the right man, at the right time, changed everything in Billy Graham. Life. You say, well, preacher, I, you're telling us that there may be a right time, a right person, the right contact that changes my life. I can't believe for that. I, you Don't get people's hope up, hopes up. Well, I'm going to tell you, listen, don't worry about it. It'll never happen to you. Because I'm trying to talk to believers. These signs should follow them that believe. If I've got somebody here believing, you know what? I just feel something in my spirit that that's mine. Mine. That's mine. The night the boy preached on the Holy Ghost from Southwestern College, he said, you can, you can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I was 15 years old, looked up at him, and I said, I just got saved, but I believe that's mine. I reached out and grabbed it in the air and stayed down at the front until I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Some of you need to reach out in the heavenlies and say, this is about my time to get some changes in my family, in my, life, in my body, in my finances. It's about my time. That gunman thought he won. He thought he won. You got your gun. You shooting innocent kids. You're winning. Yeah. That's what communism thought. For 40 something years, they thought we won. But in Prague, Czechoslovakia, where bells had not rung for 40 years, birds had made their nest. Bells began to ring in 1989. Birds filled the sky from bells that was ringing in their ears. And there was a sign out in front of a church that said this, the lamb wins. The lamb wins. Communism, you beat people to death, starved them to death, you tried to triumph, but you didn't win. And I'm reminded of the fact of what God can do through the little lady that I've told you many times about who was praying at her house about bread. Didn't have bread, but she went to the Father and said, Father, you promised me bread, and I'm claiming bread. While she was praying, two boys walked up on the porch, and they heard her crying out inside the house. They got close to the door. They heard her saying, I want some bread. I need some bread. And they said, we'll pull a prank. They went down to the grocery store and bought a loaf of bread, climbed up on top of her roof and dropped it down to the chimney. She heard the thud, went over there and found the bread, dusted it off, went over and began eating her bread, was having oh, a thank you Jesus party. When all of a sudden the knock came on the door and the little boys, she opened the door and they were there and they said, what you doing? She said, I'm eating some bread. Where'd you get it? I got it from God. Ha, 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 ha. Ah, and that's where you're wrong. We heard your prayer. We answered your prayer. We put it down the chimney. That was us. She said, ah, no, God still sent it. The the devil may have delivered it, but God still sent it. If God has to make the devil your delivery boy, he's still Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. Somebody needs to stand on your feet and say, thank you, Jesus.
Jesus for restitution of all things. We're not having an altar call. Here's what we're doing. Because I think all of us can say there's areas in my life, Lord, I need restoration. So across this building, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you can think of an area that you desperately need restored.